Hello, I'm Thomas Hare, Chief Content Officer of the Performance Driven Marketing Institute, a not-for-profit trade association that serves companies in the performance and direct consumer marketing world. Welcome to the first event in our summer seminar series today created by the PDMI's Workshop Council, Can You Hear It? Audio is a performance marketing powerhouse. We welcome all of you to today's event, PDMI members and non-members alike. If you're not a PDMI member, but are attending today, we'd love to have you consider joining the association. There's no better way to support the mission of the PDMI than joining and sharing your voice in the direction of this industry. In the handouts tab of your control panel, you'll find our brand new PDMI membership brochure. I urge you to download it, flip through it, and contact any of our team members should you desire more information. One more housekeeping note, the group will be addressing any questions from the audience at the end of today's session, but you don't have to wait to ask them. Utilize the questions tab on your control panel to type and send your question in. We'll be collecting them and we'll try to get to as many as possible in the final moments of the webinar. You know, audio has become a powerful and diverse media channel that drives brand awareness, customer growth, and dynamic ROAS. Not only is it one of the oldest ad channels, but it also offers the largest reach and one facet at least, podcast, is the fastest growing. Today's expert panel will support the, explore the many facets of audio, probe current marketer perceptions and attitudes, and help you understand the uniqueness of different channels. Let's meet the group. We've got Jill Albert, president and founder at Direct Results. Uh, we'd like to welcome Eric Stiepel, director, emerging platforms and performance advertising at Fox Media. And our moderator and PDMI Workshop Council member, Mike Batisto, president of Target and Response. Thank you all for joining us. Let's get started. Mike, please take it away. Thank you, Tom. And uh, Jill, Eric, and I would definitely like to thank everyone who is attending for taking some time out of your day uh, to spend with us. We hope that it's informative. Uh, we work very hard to get the content just right for uh, you. Hopefully we, we succeeded in that goal. Um, before we get started, I thought it would be good to get a little bit deeper insight into who each of the panelists are. Um, so I'll have each speaker give a quick background on themselves. We'll start with Jill. Okay, hello and thank you for joining. I'm Jill Albert president and founder of Direct Results. Direct Results has been in business for 17 years. We are um, a company that specializes in customer acquisition using all forms of audio, uh, We uh, that being radio, uh, quite frankly, in, in the world of radio event marketing, um, promotions, um, certainly satellite streaming and podcasts we've been uh, we've got an office in new york as an office in la and some of our premier clients might be like uh, omaha steaks or angie but we work really the gamut from all different kinds of advertisers always in customer acquisition eric uh it's so great to be here with uh, you jill and mike as well uh i represent the fox audio network consists the fox audio network uh consists of fox news fox sports uh, TMZ has an entire network of podcasts, as well as the Outkick franchise. So our content covers news, sports, politics, entertainment. Uh, we're currently developing new content around uh, true, uh, I'm sorry, uh, health and fitness, as well as society and culture. And we recently launched some new true crime podcasts as well. And we broke the top 10 in terms of unique listens uh, as sourced by PodTrack. So uh, yeah, that's that's uh, I represent Fox Audio Network, and that's pretty much what we do. Okay, and uh, and as Tom mentioned, I'm Mike Batista. I'm president of Target Response in Chicago. Um, I've been involved in direct marketing in the audio space for over 30 years now. Um, whereas I work with all forms of radio, I have a very long history in building terrestrial radio advertising campaigns for uh, direct marketers. Uh, so we plan on covering a vast array of topics. Hopefully we have enough time to do that. Um, so why don't we just jump right in? Uh, let's get started with kind of a, a, a intro into audio. Um, so I'm going to direct this first question to, to Jill. Um, Jill, what are some of the different fo audio formats that are out there and what makes each channel unique? And, you know, when should an advertiser consider including a segment into a multi-channel campaign? Okay, that is a ear full of questions, but I'll start with with a few. Um, so first of all, we look at um, you know essentially four, maybe five forms of audio. That being local radio, national radio, podcast, streaming, and satellite. So local radio. Um, first of all, I always want to talk so about radio or 
radio in itself has a, a huge reach, about a 91% reach on all adult demos. Local radio is live and local. Stations are granted licenses specifically to serve the local community. So people listen to those stations and those personalities day after day, week after week, uh, month after month, and, and so on. And they trust those local talent to deliver you know, news, community, and lifestyle information that's relevant to their listeners. And that kind of information is really relevant, not only about local information, but also about product information. So, um, you know, when, you're, when your friend tells you that you, you know, that their favorite local restaurant is the place to go, it's similar to hearing a message like that from your local audio personality because you're listening every single day. Local radio is also excellent for testing messaging because of course the cost is much lower than national radio. National radio, excellent reach, excellent talent, tremendous, tremendous efficiencies. Um, streaming, we can layer on all kinds of information in terms of data that allows us to reach specific and solely different demographics like 100,000 plus that is interested in buying a luxury car in the next four months. So we can look at very specific data from that perspective, but there's no personalities, of course, for, for streaming. Um, and then, of course, um, satellite, very good for um, sort of bridging from television programming to audio programming, similar programming. Um, but then sort of podcast, which is sort of the sweetheart of it all, which is appointment, lean in radio, um, people choose those shows and those personalities based on what they love and topics that they want to hear more about. And we see when we can implement honest, engaging product endorsements, there's, you know, the, the return on ad spend is absolutely beautiful. Um, podcasters are, it's so important to podcasters to deliver messages that are authentic. So there's a tremendous opportunity um, when we look at podcast advertising for endorsements as well. So that's maybe a good place to start. Um, Eric, you want to add to that? Yeah, you mentioned, uh, you know, podcasting being sort of the sweetheart of it all. And, and often we will get brands that are coming to us saying, that, hey, we've been in terrestrial for a while. We've been in satellite and it's worked really well. Help us to understand podcasting. And I think podcasting is somewhat uh, can be, it's a, such a nuanced uh, a platform, but I think it can be somewhat in, intimidating and, um, you know, and hard for, for people to kind of figure out how to do it. So we, we really work to simplify it and sort of demystify it. I think if you look, you know, if you pay attention to the media, you'll see podcasting. I mean, one day you're hearing uh, the positive trends and forecasts for, for revenue predicted to go to four or five billion dollars over the course of the next five years, or I'm sorry, the next four year, two years ending in 2025. And then the next day you read Spotify's laying off 300 people, or, or you read right after that, that the number of podcasts have been reduced uh, dramatically from 21 to 22. But I think what you really have to do is take a deep dive and really look at that, look at that information and look at the data. So, you know, you're talking about the reduction in podcasts. We, 2020, we saw 1 million new podcasts being produced that were produced in 2020 at the height of the pandemic. In 2021, we saw that number drop to 750 some odd thousand podcasts, new podcasts being produced. And last year, that number dropped to 225,000 new podcasts being produced. So if you look at those numbers on face value, there's a tendency to say, maybe the sky is falling in podcasting. What is the true story here? But when you give that more context, and you, and, you, and you look at it from this standpoint, well, there are 5 million podcasts in the world, right? Uh, about half of those are, 2.5 million are based in the U.S. Half of those podcasts get 10,000 or fewer listeners. Most, now, most of them, those, almost all of them have 10,000. Almost all of them have, I want to say almost all of them have less than like 2,000 listeners. Little tiny listeners, you know. They me are. And my and, and those listeners and those podcasts are very important. Those are it's, it's because it is very important for us to monetize the long tail. Those are very important. But I think what we've seen now are publishers really focus on quality over quantity, right? How can we tell more engaging stories and uh, deeper stories with great storytelling? Then if you look at the data, the data supports this because now if you look at the time 
uh, the number of new podcast listeners, I think that number went from 80 million to 100 million. That's active podcast listener, listeners in the US. Time spent has gone up to nine hours uh, on a weekly basis. And the number of downloads has increased significantly year over year. So obviously that investment in really creating deeper, richer content has really paid off. So you put it all together, then you see uh, that uh, you know those positive trend lines are really there and continue to grow for the podcast space. Yeah, and so to kind of tie a bow on it, uh, you know, what I really love about audio is the fact that it has really diversified and it's kept itself relevant even in this digital age. Um, you've got a digital side of, of audio advertising, which you talked about, streaming radio, podcasts, definitely. And then you've got the terrestrial side with satellite and terrestrial radio, the non-digital. Um, what I really love about audio is the fact that you can actually, ex if you find content that resonates with your particular advertiser or who your consumer is of your product, um, you can actually move from digital to from e all the different formats that audio has now become and and expand your pro expand your buy, right? I mean, Eric, you you handle all audio for for Fox, right? I'm sure there are times where if someone finds a sweet spot in a in a podcast that you can actually find ways to extend that same opportunity into other channels that are not not digital or other digital channels right exactly exactly i mean uh you know a lot of the brands that come to us are direct to consumer brands right they have grown and scaled in social <clears throat> And they're looking for that next step. But they need to reach a new audience, and often podcasting will be that bridge that takes them to the next step, uh, where they can really see tremendous ROAS in the audio space if done properly. Again, this it's not as easy as just putting uh, taking your script that maybe you used uh, in radio in terrestrial radio, but it's really kind of understanding the nuances and creating something truly unique. And as you said, Mike, yes, we can extend. Uh, extend brands beyond audio and into uh, into different areas, whether that's television, um, that we have those opportunities that we can do as well. So Eric, I think I just want to throw in one thing and that is, um, I think sometimes people don't use audio because it is a moving, breathing, difficult to wrap your arms around target. Um, but I would tell you that um, anything that is highly personal, any decision making that is highly personal, can be incredibly effective in the audio space. So, you know, certainly the messaging is 65, 75% of, of, the, of the importance of effectiveness, but almost every product, well, any product that has a high personal value, um, you know, something that you have a hard time deciding what to buy, something that's for your family, something that you're going to ingest, um, anything that you're gonna spend a lot of time making a personal decision about, audio and the use of storytelling through audio is magic and the qualitative and quantitative data that we can match is phenomenal and the data that we have that can follow um, this successful return on advertising spend is um, it, it is incredibly effective um, so you know it's easy to avoid because it's a hard thing to wrap your arms around but um, it, it's incredibly effective when used correctly and the audience, the audience and the, the podcasting audience, if you look at, they're gonna over index against everything you can possibly think of. They make more money, they're more educated. They're just a much more desirable audience. Now, all of our audiences, I, I work for a major publisher, so I'm not selling against the TV audiences or any of those other audiences, but when you really look at that, that uh, the, the audio audience, they're just they're coming in, they wanna be informed, they wanna learn. Um, they, they, you know, most of it is they word of mouth. You, what's that? They want to be entertained. And there's a huge yeah. amount of data that says that when people are entertained, when people are happy, when people are engaged, they're more likely to absorb your message and respond to your message. So, you know, that's, you know, who doesn't feel great when they're singing aloud to their favorite song? I mean, that's the way to put a smile on somebody's face. That's the time to hit them. 
or when they're when they're you know fully engaged with a favorite you know football game or you know what the whole idea about audio is that it's incredibly engagement engaging because theater of the mind and the opportunity to tell stories by people that you trust and like is phenomenal but i i'm kind of slowing us down so go ahead <laughs> yeah, no, but I, I think that's a great point jill because theater of the mind when you start engaging when you have an engaged listener um and they're building a, a vision in their heads that stays with somebody that has that means your message will have more impact and have a longer tail and i'm sure we've all seen campaigns that have have that we've done it on various forms of audio um that have a very long tail because of that that sticking power of course and like for us when it comes to choosing you know, satellite streaming audio i mean we're seeing just as much success in podcasts as we are in radio podcasts are incredibly engaging radio has a lower cost per thousand and a higher reach but we're seeing the very similar success it just depends on what the product is and what the offer is we're also seeing just to throw it out there we're also seeing because we measure everything we're seeing an over 96 percent success in meeting or exceeding advertisers goals so it's very easy in the audio space not easy it's very um uh, you know it happens all the time 96 percent plus in meeting or, or exceeding advertisers goals based on their own metrics because we're able to measure and, and that measurement is what allows us to move successfully and consistently towards um you know meeting advertiser goals and then also to scale yeah measurement is that's huge i mean you know what's your attribution model how are you measuring and what are you measuring i get brands that come to us and there's they will say listen we've been using an 800 number in terrestrial and an 800 number in satellite it works fantastic we're not changing it and that's the last thing we want to do is encourage someone to change what has been working for them in fact that's part of our discovery process when we begin to work with the brand tell us what has worked for you um what have you done and, and if they do have some of those learnings they can share them with us and that really informs us of how we move forward we have some brands that come to us and say we've tried just about everything in terms of measurement but here's what works for us we want one url we do not want to create multiple uh, URLs that's or multiple landing pages. Different. We don't want multiple codes that can get lost. Um, and we're going to tie a pixel to it, and that's going to be our model, and that's what we're going to. That's how we're going to measure. Uh, you know, we 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 really encourage multiple data points and and measuring multiple data points because ultimately we're looking to have those all of those data points point in the right direction and say, this is working or this is not working. So the measurement portion of it, Jill, uh, as you know, it can be very intimidating as well for some advertisers. Mike, what, do, what are your thoughts on that in terms of? Yeah, I, 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 there is definitely a perception that may exist out there that ha, that that audio can't be measured. Um, of course, on the digital side of audio, I don't know how you can say that because it's as, it's as measurable and using the same type of technologies as, as any social media or, or other digital um, execution. I know on the terrestrial and satellite, it can be it can be more challenging because how do you measure the response that that exists that goes on online when you're not a cookieing somebody, for example. Um, but I but I know that but I think that what you can do is you you definitely can utilize some of those other. Uh, uh, response mechanism is, that you had mentioned, Eric, a, a unique URL, a, 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 a sales code, um, surveys on a website or on your website that ask people where they came from, where they heard about you. Those are things. And then um, I know that 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 Jill does a lot of more extensive measuring um, moving from terrestrial online and that anecdotally you can measure that as well. Maybe, Jill, you can elaborate on that. I mean, you guys talked about them already pretty, pretty, pretty well. Um, you know, when it comes to Omaha Steaks, every probably 98% of our advertising with Omaha Steaks is with personalities. Every personality has a code, so at checkout, you put that code, um, and that code gets you, for instance, $30 off. That's so very, very effective. And while it's not 100%, it's certainly incredibly helpful in um, 
driving direction. Um, we also use, there's two different forms of um, tracking. One of them is Analytica Owl, the other one is Leads. Um, when a ad runs, we can then measure the response of uh, different radio stations, different um, programming, different times, different messaging to see who goes to the website. And again, it's not 100%, but it's very, very directional and very helpful. We can use it to not only help us to see what stations are more effective, but we can also use it, and we also do use it to, to negotiate. So this station is delivering a $10 cost per lead. This station is delivering a $20 cost per lead. We try to take a look at all the ways station number one is successful, and we copy or use that to negotiate station number two. Um, so those are those are effective. And then, of course, once um, a person gets to the site, then we, then we place a pixel and we pixel track them for the, the, for the duration of their experience until they um, purchase. And of course, you know, this is maybe a good time to even talk briefly about the funnel in terms of, you know, audio is very, very effective of bringing people to a high and a mid-level of the funnel and even bringing them through the funnel. But bringing people that are interested in the category, interested in the product, um, that are well qualified into the funnel so that they can then be retargeted over and over again until the purchase, until the final purchase is made. Yeah, I think it's an, this is an excellent opportunity for us to talk about the use of audio, different audio channels to kind of fill the funnel. Um, uh, so I, I think that, that for me, um, what I really love about audio and, and one of the problems or one of the issues that I have with how some digital are executed is that Digital tends to really be have its strength mired in getting your message out to people who are in market for your product or service. It's not really the best tool to utilize to mass market and generate. I think audio does an excellent job. There's a variety of different uh, 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 benefits. I think the local is definitely one of them. So yeah, Jill, you, you look like you have an idea to, to take us moving down that path. No, 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 no. You're, you're doing great. I'm not sure where you want, want to go with this. Okay. I'm just saying, um, why don't why don't we each talk about how or maybe some client engagements or um, opportunities or, or ways that that audio can be used um, to help fill that funnel that that move up an advertiser from where they are. They, let's say we have an advertiser who does most of their advertising uh, digitally using social media and now has has reached that stage where um, the opportunity has maximized the return and now they need to expand where does audio kind of play in in that um uh, execution uh, do you want i think you know audio is there's a low cost of entry right um we see yeah, you, know, you can kind of scale it however you you want. Tests come in, twenty thousand dollar test. That's you know twenty thousand dollars in TVs doesn't get you might get you a unit or two. Um, so there's a low cost of entry. We see CPMs are going down. CPMs are going down as a result of there being so much inventory out there, as well as economic conditions, and we'll get into that in a bit. But um, I think you you overall now you have a lower CPMs, you have a lower cost of entry for a performance marketer. Now we're, you know, lower CPMs equal lower cost, lower cost per acquisition to begin with. So now um, it, it, it's, it, it can be some efficient, an efficient play to move into audio, um, but you can get the reach and you can really find that audience that you are, that, that audience that you are looking for that will consume your, your product. Um, and I think you also have to look at uh, that connection with the host right with with the host because that's a very big part of audio and making it work well uh, particularly in podcasts where you're you know it's a host read that you're looking for and more and more it's not just a host read anymore but it's we're getting requests for we want a personal endorsement we want to know that that host has an authentic relationship with that product because that is really what's going to resonate with that audience and that's what's going to help us move move product um, so I think from that standpoint, again, it goes back to just kind of doing it correctly and really taking our time. Uh, it's a collaborative effort. Uh, we, 
we like to spend a lot of time with our clients and agencies and just really sort of hone and craft something that works really well. Um, we have brands that from there, we have moved them on to television and linear uh, activations. And conversely, brands that have been on television for brands, like uh, true brands that have been on, on, on the linear side that are coming to audio and saying, hey, we want to figure this strategy out um, um, and figure out how to use it effectively. So um, that's that's what I would say. Yeah, I was just going to um, kind of maybe pick up from there. So when we do endorsements, because we do a lot of endorsements, we don't give anybody a script. Um, if it's an ingestible, like um, let's say it's a um, vitamin or let's say it's um, Omaha Steaks, we send the product to them and we ask them what they think about it. So it's just an open mic of what do you think about Omaha Steaks? We can tell, or let's say it's an educational program, or let's say it's, you know, we do a lot of work for USC. Um, let's say it's a, um, I mean, there's, you know, re regardless of the product, we send them the product and we open mic them and say, what do you think about it? It's very easy to see within about 60 seconds whether or not they authentically have tried it and whether they not, not they like it or if they're just looking for another payday. It's probably not a nice thing to say, but um, we're only interested in personalities that really want to tell the story. Um, after they are kind of invited into um, being, being an endorser, being an influencer, then we'll send them three to five copy points and we'll ask them to tell the story to their audience. Um, in addition to that, they might do interviews with some of our, with an expert in a category. We did a campaign for Yahoo that was tied into um, one of their products and we had experts that were on the radio stations. We do media tours um, to, I think the relevance that you talked about, Eric, in terms of maybe it's the subject matter is, is relevant to something that's going on with the news. Um, we might do, oh gosh, with Omaha Steaks, we'll do like um, football parties on air where we'll have a bunch of steaks and we'll have them barbecuing the steaks so that they can be enjoying the game while they're doing it or a Father's Day party or an anniversary party. Um, you know, alternatively, gosh, I'm thinking about like, you know, when we've done products um, that have been tied into, um, gosh, Mercedes, we've done, um, um, we have the DJs go out and they test drive the cars and they just talk about how much they love the sound system or how much they love the handling or something like that. When we're talking about Angie as an Angie's list, they'll go out and they will actually use Angie's products and talk about the experience of, you know, getting the bid, um, the communication with the service provider, how good the service was. So it's really about getting out of commercial programming and into programming, sounding like you're part of the show, engaging listeners with what your product or service is so that it's believable. Um, so that's kind of a lot of what we'll do in the audio space, really trying to make it a lot more personal. Um, oh, of course, and then of course in local markets, we can do sampling or we can have radio stations out at certain sites. Um, giving away concert tickets or whatever the case may be. It's kind of a couple of examples. Yep. Hey, um, Mike, what have been interesting? Yeah, you know, one of the things I really love, and especially about the terrestrial radio side execution, is that, that you know, most advertiser and direct marketers, and rightfully so, this is exactly how you should start, is focus on trying to reach your, your target demographic, right? But what I love about the terrestrial radio is it tends to have an opportunity to, because it, it can expose your message to a much broader audience, you can't just air a, a radio commercial on terrestrial radio and only hit your the ears of your target demographic, right? You're going to get a much broader audience than what your targeting is. So what we what we do is we like to focus on rating points, which is basically taking your uh, what percentage of the the marketplace's audience um, or a radio station's audience fits within a specific demographic, which is the core demographic of your advertiser, right? And we we try to get the lowest total rating point or lowest TRP, and that's how we kind of decide where we're going to move first. But what it tends to do is because that that station can appeal to a much broader segment, sometimes it it uncovers other 
pockets of opportunity for that advertiser. Um, it was interesting to me. I had a, a client in a financial category that we worked with for a very long time who, who ended up ex experiencing that expansion beyond what he thought was really where his sweet spot was, which is still his sweet spot, but there was opportunity, cost effective opportunity in other segments. He did a, a, a client or a customer um, work segmentation study, and he found that there were segments that he didn't even know really existed that were part of his uh, target demo. Now, harder to reach, but on radio because of the bleed over, it gave that opportunity. Mike, I love it because, go ahead, I'm sorry. Eric. Mike, I just, I want to understand terrestrial a little bit more because I always thought of terrestrial or think of terrestrial as this format, um, as radio station formats. But now I don't get, really get formats. I mean, one station will play classic rock a little bit more, or this station will play this a little bit more, but they all kind of blend together. How does, can you just talk a little bit about how that, that works? Yeah, I mean, format really is where the, the primary, what you have to um, target in radio, right? What format do you want to be a news talk, adult contemporary, rock? oldies station so really that's that's what that that's a station's identity but the reality is is that they there are they have a diverse list some of them have a very um targeted listenership but some of them have a very diverse listenership and and nielsen does a great job of of exposing what that target audience is and like i said once you then you could start marrying the targeting based on the format to actually getting into demographic. But the problem is, is the bleed through, right? So that's where you, I think, had mentioned, Eric, the cost side of it, where even though I'm bleeding out and I'm I'm getting exposure to my to, to people outside of who I'm I'm targeting, um, I'm doing it in such a way that it's not impact. I, I've already assessed what it's costing me to hit my target. So that's 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 like value add, right? So that's a great way to, again, find some additional response that you'd never had or never even considered when you were doing a very highly targeted demographic digital campaign. Is that did that answer? Yes, it, it, it does. That's a that's it does it does a lot, and like you said, that comes off and you see that as value add. So that can only help in terms of whatever you're measuring cost per per acquisition however that works can only help you all right i yeah. think you, did, you explained that well and it's not only we don't want to over optimize our audience we don't want to over optimize our audience so that we're constantly making a smaller and smaller audience we want to be able to brand i mean your radio stations are well targeted and maybe not everybody is a hundred thousand plus and in the market for a new car but um, they all have a certain kind of an income that tends to be a little bit higher on a certain radio station. So people that listen to news stations tend to have a higher income, tend to have a higher level of education, that kind of thing. Um, also, I think in, in our space, in all of our spaces, um, you know, we use qualitative data, we use Nielsen audio data, but then we also use response data. So, you know, we've been tracking response data for I want to say our company for 14 years. So in addition to using Nielsen Audio and all of that media audit and Scarborough information, the first place that we look at is return on, you know, is ROAS, ROAS data, you know, return on, um, you know, pure data that shows this radio station or this program or this, um, you know, podcast delivered, for instance, a female, um, that was interested in buying a health and beauty product um, at under a $50 cost per sale. So the cost per sale data is the first place that we look in every case. And that's really incredibly valuable and all direct marketers use that kind of information. Just I, pure, I it's just pure response, data, pure response data, nothing's better. Yeah, I, I'm curious, Jill, do you, the, the, the interesting part is that at how much faith do you put into very Tar specific data that's at the micro level of this ad and this on this station versus looking at the big picture and seeing overall because sometimes can't you get a skewed yeah. result when you have a measurement problem as for our team the number one thing that we look at is pure response data that's the number one thing 
The other information, um, you know, it all fits into the equation, but, you know, your knocker, that's what you, works best, right? So what, what's, where does your simple logic fit in? So pure response data is incredible because, for instance, I'm in LA, you've got KNX, which is a news station, KFI, which is a news talk information station. The audience profile looks exactly the same, but the reality is, is that their audience responds differently to different kinds of messages. So that's, and that's consistent. Over time, you'll consistently see that they deliver at a, a different cost per um, sale. So, or maybe one of them is more interested in health and wellness products, and the other one is more interested in a luxury car. So that data is so important, but we're really, you know, years and years ago, this is probably a, a crazy place to go, but years and years ago, Google tried to automate everything audio. Just, you know, just buy this demographic. And, and audio can't be particularly automated because it's personalities. It's matching personalities with products and services. And the personalities are alive, you know what I mean? So it can't be strictly data. It has to be data and logic and integration and engagement. Um, there's a lot to it. Um, you know, that's that's why you work with people that, um, you know, are really into looking at all this different data, but also looking to the personalities of it. Fair? Yeah, I would say that that, that data part of it that comes from the agency and from the client side, is something we really, really want to or, or, or ask um, clients to share with us as much of that as possible so that we can understand nothing worse as a seller than hearing it didn't work or it didn't perform without any context behind what does that mean or you know really what were we measuring? You know, you you know your unit economics and what your cost per acquisition is. And you know, we need to understand. The more we can understand, the more we can help, and the more we can be vested in, in the overall success of the campaign as well. So, um, the data is helpful, and when you follow the data, you can't get lost. You yeah. really can't. But it's not 100% everything. Yeah, I, and and I can't. You you brought up you stimulated an idea, a thought that I have, um, Eric, because you know one of the problems that I I see with advertisers is that knee-jerk reaction of I've aired my I've aired a commercial on one of the audio for two days and I'm not seeing any response yeah. so it, it must not work so it must not work it's like well that's you you have to understand there's a there's a difference in how people consume radio and because of that difference response patterns are are always different um I know that that like podcasting how how many people download a podcast and or actually listen to a podcast exactly at the moment that they download it it Zero. doesn't happen. it doesn't right. happen. Yeah. so you can listen and it, the same thing if i'm in my car and i'm listening to a terrestrial radio station and i hear a commercial that i want I'm pulling over yeah. to respond so you know you can't you can't just look at the early on you have to let an audio you really have to let something bake right you have to let frequency take over but i think what i also see is it has a much longer tail when a campaign ends i mean i've seen i had a um a home improvement company that we did a multi-channel or a, a a shop local um where we did a ton of different audio executions on different radio stations, different podcasts, um, that was highly targeted to certain cities. For almost a year after that came, campaign ended, they were still getting response from that from from that campaign that ran six months. So yeah, I, I think it's uh, interesting, an idea I wanted to bring up because you stimulated it. Yeah, you should see a response very close to immediate but that response becomes much more effective much more cost effective as the campaign grows and as the campaign becomes more um you know just the messaging becomes more effective so you know we talked a little bit about why local radio versus national radio local radio is a really good place to get the messaging good clear in sync um and then we scale right yep so why don't we, as our last topic, we talk, touched a little bit on, on some of the unique features of audio. Why don't we 
uh, dive a little bit more into that. I, I like the whole local, we, we dabbled in it a little bit. Maybe we can just put a bow on some of the things that we talked about. Um, I know, uh, Eric, you might, you might have some new things in that, that could be potentially happening on the podcast side that might be, um, innovative that, that, so I, maybe we can all share some insights in that regard. Sure. Absolutely. You know, we, we, we want to start with making sure we check off all of the boxes, um, you know, table stakes. And now more and more table stakes, our brands are coming. Um, they have safety, uh, brand safety and security issues. We want to check that box. We have solutions in place for that. Um, I talked a little bit about, um, you know, the majority of the brands that we see are performance brands. Um, so we look at price and again, you know, these economic conditions that we're in require us to be a little bit more uh, creative and, and to look a little bit harder, work a little bit harder. And this is, as a seller, this is fun. This is what we really like to do. Um, you know, we want to look at added value, not just throwing you something that we can't use, but is it going to work? Because ultimately I want you to come back and say that added value that you gave me works and now I'm ready to pay for it. So we're thinking of things of that nature. Um, we're working really hard. If a brand, uh, you know, can we figure out a way to create a sponsorship for the brand? Can we offer exclusivity? Uh, we are very close to, to green lighting a program that will allow for brands to be integrated into content uh, in an interview style format, very similar to what we would do uh, in an integration on the linear side at Fox Sports or Fox News. So we're working for that with that. So a brand would be able to come in and a CEO would be able to come in and say, um, you know, we're working with a brand, an entrepreneur and an author who's really focused on driving or bringing blue collar workers to the field. We know that there are a shortage of electricians and plumbers across the country, all of the blue collar fields. Uh, so there's a potential that we're working for him to be able to come in and be interviewed, having that story relate to current news topics. So whether that's tying it to AI or tying it to, uh, you know, economics and job growth, these are the things that we're trying to come up with to be creative and create new opportunities for brands to be able to be with us on a deeper level. So those are some of the things that we're working on. Jill, any so, thoughts on that? Well? Uh, well, in the podcast space, I would say something similar. So we see that as the podcasters do a great job with um, delivering personal endorsements, then our advertisers want to go to a 360 plan, <laughs> which allows the podcasters now to post Instagram stories, newsletters, interviews, um, TikTok, all different kinds of things like that, which are... I think from one perspective, they're really, really exciting. But then again, I want to always remind our advertisers that it has to stay authentic. So if we then take our endorsers and have them like every week tell their listeners again and again and again to buy this product, then it lacks authenticity. So we have to make sure that with everything that we do, we roll it out in a way that it allows us to continue to use those endorsers for months and years on end, um, that we, you know, we hold on to that authenticity. Because again, just to, to go back to what we talked about at the very beginning, this is all about personalities, trusting other personalities. So me listening to you, Eric, and you telling me something that is true to you, that I believe because I trust you. It's the same thing with these personalities, regardless <laughs> on podcasts or on the radio. Um, so that's been kind of fun. You know, we've got a lot of 360 campaigns that are going on right now. And the more that you have, the better you're able to have a smart cadence because when you only have five of them, then the advertisers want more and more and more. You know, I want, I want that endorser to post five times this month. Um, can't do that. It's going gonna, it's gonna to burn out and it's going to not only be bad for your brand, but bad for that endorser, which then they're going to drop you. Um, so that's something on the podcast side. Uh, and then I think, you know, on the audio side, you know, so much of what we're doing now is one of two things, drive to web or drive to retail. 
And gosh, on the retail side, we really need to figure out ways to get people in stores. So sometimes we do events in stores. We've done fashion shows in stores. We've done um, we've done events. Gosh, we did something with a low. We did a bunch of things with low income retailer where a few things. One, we we did events to help people, women, um, primarily do sort of like almost like makeovers so that they would have the confidence to go out into the marketplace and get jobs. Um, we did a casting call for kids where we had kids come out so that they could be featured um, in both the audio and the video um, commercials. And, the, and these things are just so community-based. People love them because they're super engaging, but also because it creates a lot of trust. Um, certainly, um, we do a lot of work for USC and UCLA. We'll do things on campus. Um, so, you know, I'm kind of starting to ramble, but I, I think every single brand, you know, if it's a health and wellness brand, then it's so much about how that brand fits into the lifestyle of the endorser and how it could fit into the lifestyle of you. And that is a super strong message. If it's a service, it's really about what the experience has been with that service. Um, and as much, and sometimes we'll, sometimes we'll do that through an endorsement, but very often we'll do that through testimonials of, of listeners, um, of clients. Um, we'll do, we'll create donut hole spots where we'll talk about the product and then we'll have maybe two or three users of the product or service talk about what it did for them. I mean, these are things that everybody's heard before, but there's so many different, um, you know, tactics to create an effective, um, message. And I think that's something that, you know, it's just a matter of talking to somebody who is an at audio advertising and helping them develop a message that's going to work for you and then really clearly defining what success looks like. Are we looking at cost per leads? Are we looking at cost per sales? Whatever those metrics are and then measuring them meticulously and optimizing on a constant basis. And when those pieces are put together, um, success is definitely um, in, the, in the very near future. Yeah, and I think that that definitely endorsements is a, a real strength of of audio, not just the the where they they're using the product, but even an announcer red spot has an implied endorsement, right? Because uh, that that's always been a, a more powerful read having the yeah. announcer read it than some some voice because it blends into the content of of that, and people tend to. Uh, disengage when commercial breaks come on and that's harder to do when the announcer's reading because you catch that that familiarity takes the, the the look and the feel that local aspect to it you know just all sorts of great great stuff so um at this stage i think that um we I wanted to add one little thing it's just about look so it's so often with local what our what our brand message will say is um here in Ohio, we have blah, blah, blah. Here in California, and that's super cool because um, like, you know, here, like in terms of an educational program, here in Ohio, we have X amount of, of um, people that haven't graduated. Let us help you graduate. Um, here in California, we have a certain amount of aging um, people. Let us help you get to this stage. And so that that's just another thing I want to throw in there. Second thought, yeah. excuse me. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, uh, an announcer red spot in Texas, in Boston, in uh, Detroit, and in California. They're going to all sound a little different because we all have different accents in different parts of the, the yeah, country. Just, just like if you're on a country station, you want to have the same announcer as you have on a um, urban station. I mean, let's let's be smart here. And for us, you know, more and more of those requests are coming back for that baked in read. They want a true baked in read. And I talk about that all the time. I mean, you know, the idea that Harvey Levin from TMZ can actually read your, will actually potentially be able to read your copy on air and have it be a part of this story and organic. I mean, these are things that there's, the value goes way beyond and it will continue. Mike, I think you talked about that lag when, you know, people come in and go back and listen to uh, the back catalog and really get more of that content where the value just continues to, to grow. Um, from those type of executions. So yeah, that, that it's, a, it's a fun space, it's growing. 
I think we are in a unique position to be able to come and, and evangelize and help with tell that consistent story that that uh, you know of the, the the positive trends that are happening in the in the audio space um, and be able to to really evangelize for our, our industry. Yep. Well, at this point, we have ten minutes left. We want to make sure we have room for Q and A. So, Tom, have have do we have any questions from the the uh, attendees? Well, we sure do. And actually, you know what, guys, you all, you already went into Q&A because the first question I was going to be about uh, live reads, particularly on podcasts. So you guys just hammered that one out right there. I did want to note, though, that in my own podcast listening that I've recently heard live talent reads for both Angie and HelloFresh, both PDMI members. So that was great to, oh. great to note. <laughs> <laughs> um, we'll skip past that question since you guys uh, pretty much nailed that one um and i've got a question here um asking uh have you heard and obviously we're all on the media side here but have you heard of uh folks out there using ai and chat gpt for content ideas to re record as podcasts and i'll i'll double down on that and say have have you seen anyone using ai or chat gpt to um, create ads that would go on podcasts I can take it. Anybody else you want to start, Eric? Go, you start, and I'm gonna, and I'm gonna. I have some thoughts on that too. I, I just want to refer to it. So <laughs> add on that. Very so far, time. what we've seen is that people that want to create ads with AI, um, super um, thorough content, but that lacks the personality and the creativity to connect with people. Um, so that's kind of that's the top line of what we're seeing so far. And I think it's going to be a little bit of time before that real connection can be made. I would agree with that. It's it's um, it's not a dynamic performance right now. I think people are getting acclimated to the, the idea of it, voice recognition, artificial voice. I think we are playing around with it in some formats to be able to, for instance, if there's a really long disclaimer or if it's a brand that's regional that only operates in certain regions and we need to be able to produce that disclaimer in 42 states and they want to change their creative three times a month. We are exploring opportunities to be able to have artificial voice voicing to do things like that. But in terms of actually having that that uh, dynamic experience, nothing can replace that true human experience um, with having a, a, a live person being able to uh, come in and, and voice that. Yeah, I, I just sat on a panel last week for BWG, and there are two um, recognizable um, heads that were on that. And they just said they're not that concerned because while AI is certainly something that's in play, they still need to have high profile creative artists. So, you know, no one's going to listen to music unless it's in the elevator, um, unless there's a Rihanna attached to it, or unless there's a, I don't know. The whole other spectrum, Garth Brooks, whatever, you know, I mean, um, creativity and engagement is more important. Great, guys. Uh, good answers. Um, a couple of uh, baseline questions came in, too, about just size of market. Uh, audio is a group, terrestrial satellite podcasting. How big is the total audio audience in the U.S., and what is the largest medium? Well, you know, uh, Terrestrial radio has the, the largest reach. Um, the last Nielsen report I read said 92% of U.S. adults uh, tune in a, a week on a weekly basis. Uh, uh, so I know that I can answer that part of the question. I'll leave it to my counterparts to fill in the other gaps. Yeah, according to Pew, there are 100 million active audio listeners, podcast listeners in the U.S. And I don't know how that relates to, to the other formats, but uh, that's according to Pew. Yeah, so I think uh, radio is somewhere in the 230 million range. Um, podcast is in the 100 million range. But, of course, podcast continues to grow um, with older demographics growing. And certainly, I think we're seeing a lot of growth also among um, some ethnic groups as well. So early adapters tend to be men, younger men, but we're seeing huge growth there. Yeah, it's the fastest growing group in the podcast space. So that's a good thing. Yep. And it's hard to really put a number of a bow around all audio because there's there's bleed over, right? People listen to to terrestrial podcasts, streaming. So it'd be hard for us to kind of say overall 
this is how many people listen to uh, as a as a group. Right, but what we're seeing is that um, if you listen to the podcast, it doesn't take away from radio. And if you listen to streaming, it doesn't take away from radio or podcast. If you listen to satellite, it tends to take away from radio because people listen in their cars. And of course, it's an upscale demographic people subscribe to. But radio, streaming, and podcasts are all kind of working together to bring just more sort of like the spoken word and the storytelling is of in, is of greater interest than it was 10 years ago. Excellent point. Yeah. Excellent stuff. Um, <clears throat> another one. Do you see podcasts as a lead gen slash direct response media? It would seem to require frequency of message that can get spendy. The answer is yes. Uh, it does require frequency, but there are lots of different ways um, to, to get that done with, um, you know, really looking at your, at your flight total budget. Um, how do we make that work again? There's so many, we're, we're, we work really hard, uh, to, to earn those opportunities, um, from the sales side in terms of, you know, if, if we want the efficiency of an RON schedule, right. Um, we will we'll try to create RON, but put each each placement on its own line line item because ultimately we want to know what works and give you more of that what works. So um, while yes, it does require frequency, but we're going to work with you in real time, optimizing to make sure that you're in the right place, that what that it is working and trending in the right direction. Um, so. It's just like anything else. It does require some of you to get in there and kind of roll up the sleeves and and, and get to work and, and find what works. There is no one size fits all and there's no silver bullet. We have to work. Yeah. Um, hear about addressability so on I want to add to that. Um, I, I okay, think yeah, that what Eric's saying is so oh. important. No, I wanted to add to what Eric was saying because there's so many podcast publishers out there. And when you find pop podcast publishers that you trust, that's the people you wanna do business with. So as Eric talks about, we try really hard to earn people's respect and to earn their trust. Um, there are so many out there and there's you know, 4 million, 5 million podcasts, whatever the number is today, um, but you create partnerships. And it's, it's about programming, about partnerships and about people that you can trust. So just as Eric talks about, we work really hard to make sure you get the return on, on investment that you need, you need that in the partner. So when you talk to different podcasters, and I would recommend that you talk to people that do a lot of podcast advertising because it's a hard thing to get good at, um, you make sure that you work with people that want to make sure that you meet your goals rather than want to sell you something because like Joe Rogan is phenomenal. He is phenomenal. Um, but at, you know, $20,000 a pop, it's really hard to get the return on ad spend. So it depends on what you're trying to accomplish. Um, you know, somebody like an Eric might be able to sell you some really high profile, super cool shows, but then also be able to use this run of network to help you make sure you deliver your numbers. So let's throw that in there. Great, great, great. Oh. Thanks, Jill. <laughs> um, well, I'm going to wedge one more in before we go. Um, We've heard a lot about addressability on TV, our podcasts and or streaming growing into more addressable um, and where are they in the growth path? I will note that I have noticed on a couple of podcasts I listen to, I'm being delivered more Massachusetts centric things than I have in the past. And actually even on some streaming radio, I mean, I'm you know, still listening to some LA radio stations, even on some streaming radio, I'm getting stuff that's more directed to where I am now. Is that happening and where's it at? Eric, you or me? Uh, you take it, Joe. All right. So there's two different kinds of ads. There's baked in or there's DAI. If you if you're advertising DAI, dynamic inserted ads, then if you're on a large enough podcast or a large enough podcast network, then you can deliver ads that are specific and solely to certain kinds, certain regions or certain people. Um, what you lose with that is you lose the baked in personal endorsement. What you gain with that is the ability to target specific areas. Is that fair, Eric? Anything to add to that? Yeah, I think that's spot on. Um, that the ability to geo target, you limit that with the baked in. So, um, and if your product is only available in certain areas or certain regions, then it, it, it makes sense to really put that geo layer on top of it. So, 
So you will begin to see more and more. These are things, again, brands are asking for more than they had in the past. They want, they're really learning. They have learnings and they want to hone in on the best way, most efficient way to reach their audience. So if they're only operating in certain states, they don't want the waste. Perfect. Well, hey, guys, thank you so much. Uh, we're about out of time. I'm going to rejoin you on screen here. We appreciate you, Jill and Mike and Eric. Just amazing, great insights uh, for all of you who have been watching today. Know that this is going to be on our YouTube channel uh, in the next probably 48 hours. Tell a friend uh, to visit our YouTube channel to watch if you found this at all interesting. Uh, thank you again to the speakers and to the Workshop Council for bringing us today's event. If you are a PDMI member and would like to get involved in creating it, these webinars, you can reach out to me to directly to share your interest in the Workshop Council or any of our other councils today. Your next opportunity to attend a live PDMI online event is our next edition of Take 20, our bi-monthly webinar series created by the Brand Response Council, which happens tomorrow at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific, and media experts will discuss the growth of fast channels and what it means for performance marketers. To register for the webinar, please visit the pdmi.com slash take-20. Also, online registration is open for PDMI West, October 9th through 11th in San Diego. Badge holders get first opportunity to book their hotel rooms in our discounted block at the event's new host, the luxurious Intercontinental San Diego. So visit the PDMI.com slash PDMI-West for more info and to grab your badge today. Thank you again for joining us. Be well. All of you on screen, thank you so much. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.